Okay. Uh, is your recording also started, Lenny? There we right. go. Excellent. So good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, for our weekly CAT conference again. Um, we It's great to have uh, Dr. Sandeep Nathan join us. Sandeep, I don't know how much you know about a Monty Hart CAT conference, but you know we have a lot of people who join in the morning, but a lot of others who join later and watch this on YouTube later. So uh, it'll actually get watched a lot, but we're really delighted to have you talk to us. I uh, for those of you who don't know Dr. Nathan, he's a professor of medicine, as you can see. And it's interesting and it's unusual for me still to see interventional cardiologists who keep such a big clinical practice, such as you. So to still run the cardiac intensive care unit as well as the cath lab, uh, that must be a lot. Uh, but it also allows you, I guess, to be an expert in the, in the area we're going to talk about because you really get to see these patients in the lab and then afterwards. So Dr. Nathan's going to be talking to us about ischemic salvage in primary PCI, in particular, the role of supersaturated oxygen. Okay, Azim, thank you so much for the, uh, the kind uh, invitation and uh, introduction. Uh, about my titles, I think I'm just too stupid to say no. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think that's how you get to those titles. Um, but, you know, kidding aside, it, it does uh, allow us, I think, um, at University of Chicago, um, the uh, general CCU side is run by interventional cardiologists, uh, primarily. Then there's a heart failure transplant side and, of course, a cardiothoracic surgical side, 32-bed ICU. And it does allow you to sort of see the entire story arc for STEMI patients. I think many times as interventional cardiologists, we're sort of pigeonholed. We have a, a very focal you know, sort of a narrow focus on uh, getting the vessel open uh, and then, uh, you know, making the appropriate recommendations, but not really seeing how that uh, sort of follows through. So in the next 45 minutes or so, I'd like to share with you uh, our clinical experience with uh, supersaturated O2, of course, review some of the data, but then really kind of get into the weeds of the, the practical aspects of it. Okay, so here are my disclosures. The only ones that are relevant here is that I've served as a consultant to Zoll, and I'm also involved in uh, some of the data monitoring and steering of uh, ongoing uh, clinical research in the area of supersaturated O2. So to just uh, familiarize or remind everybody about the epidemiology of acute myocardial infarction in the United States, uh, somewhere in the US, uh, every 40 seconds, someone has a heart attack that amounts to about 800,000 people. This is non-STEMI and STEMI, of course, and a uh, significant proportion of these patients are unfortunately repeat customers. Within the first five years after an acute myocardial infarction, uh, one in five will have recurrent um, uh, myocardial infarction or fatal cardi uh, cardiovascular death. Uh, uh, up to a quarter will have heart failure and a significant proportion will ultimately succumb to cardiovascular disease. So it really kind of begs the question, if this is uh, such a highly visible uh, diagnosis and uh, one that uh, really hasn't gone away despite our best uh, therapies and advances in medicine, um, are we good at predicting outcomes in STEMI? So let me share with you a case. This is an actual unmassaged case. This is a patient in my clinical practice that I continue to follow. Uh, and when he came in, he was uh, 33 years old. Uh, only uh, notable past medical history was controlled hypertension one hour of oppressive substernal chest pain associated with nausea uh, and uh, some diaphoresis, no prior episodes uh, and uh, no uh, illicits or, or bad habits. And you can see here uh, really prominent ST elevations, uh, antraceptal as well as in the high lateral leads, reciprocal depressions in the inferior leads. So uh, right radial approach, 5-6 uh, uh, slender access, uh, an Ikari IL-1 uh, guide catheter, uh, excuse me, IL-3.5 guide catheter. Uh, and the patient goes to the lab after being loaded with aspirin and, uh, and ticagrelor. And you can see here uh, quite plainly that there is a cloud of thrombus in the LAD proximal. Uh, some of it appears to have embolized into the distal LAD and, uh, and clipped the apical segment. RCA and circumflex are ostensibly free of uh, any disease uh, at all. Um, and so uh, we get to work. Uh, he's not in shock. He's got uh, a pretty compensated hemodynamics. Uh, we get a, a run through wire through uh, balloon, uh, the vessel and our uh, door to balloon is 67 minutes, very similar to the national average or the median uh, numbers, which I'll review in just a few slides. 
And uh, to get the vessel open quickly, we uh, we stent with a 3.5 by 35 millimeter open cell stent, uh, knowing that we can post dilate it as we need to without uh, without any difficulty. And so this is what we get uh, afterwards. Um, a thrombosed uh, LAD uh, distally is treated with some uh, IC and IV eptifibotide, then a little bit of uh, gentle bottle brushing with uh, a winged balloon uh, and, and PTCA of the apical LAD. There's still some um, vessel that's not well reperfused distally. And so we give pulse spray adenosine and nitroglycerin through uh, a, a Caravel microcatheter, uh, there's still a small segment of uh, thrombus uh, with Timmy zero flow in the apical LAD. So we sort of scratch our heads and say, at this point, what else can we do for, uh, for thrombus clearance? And so we don't do this very often, but uh, there is a small body of literature on the use of laser in uh, relatively fresh thrombus. This is on the bench, uh, what a 0.9 millimeter uh, laser fiber looks like in four hour old uh, thrombus. Uh, and uh, you can see it's actually pretty effective at uh, clearing thrombus. And that's what we did. We made a number of passes, uh, as you can see on the prior slide, uh, at um, 45, 25, and 60, 40, uh, all the way down to the apex. And, um, and then we uh, ivocized uh, the, uh, the stent up top, realized that the proximal portion was a little bit undersized and uh, ballooned everything up with a 4.5 millimeter balloon. Uh, and uh, this is the final result. Um, so I think a technically satisfactory result, I think if you really want to sort of squint at it, you could say, okay, well, the flow in the apex isn't, isn't the best, but you do have reemergence of uh, uh, most of the septal perforators and diagonals all the way, uh, all the way down to the apex. Uh, side branches are preserved, even in the stented segment door to balloon is 67 mil, uh, minutes. This is what his LV looks like one day post STEMI. Uh, not great. Um, you can see that there's a big apical wall motion abnormality. Fortunately, no thrombus there. But um, uh, at one year, uh, despite a very short ischemic time, about an hour, uh, and a very satisfactory door to balloon, 67 minutes, um, this is what we end up with. Uh, there's a clot at the apex one year uh, later, and on a DOAC, the clot clears up, but the wall motion abnormality never really goes away. And he's left with about a 40% uh, ejection fraction. Fortunately, he's NYHA class one uh, on GDMT, maxed out on GDMT, uh, the entire kitchen sink. Uh, but I think it illustrates the point that you do all the right things and you don't necessarily get the desired result in anterior STEMI. So that's a segue to contemporary trends in post-STEMI survival. This is uh, foundational data on door to balloon that was published in 2006, 29,000 patients uh, from NERMI three and four uh, spanning 1999 to 2002 were treated with PCI from six hours of presentation at nearly 400 hospitals that were participating. There is a clear uh, linear association uh, between in-hospital mortality and door to balloon time. So door to balloon time as the independent variable uh, as it gets closer to less than or equal to 90 minutes, you can see this drop in in-hospital uh, mortality. Uh, and in-hospital mortality on the second panel and door-to-balloon time in patients stratified by risk factor status. This is sort of a kind of an ominous uh, hint that if you do have risk factors, however, uh, perhaps you don't perform as well as the overall uh, population did. If you uh, have uh, no risk factors going into your STEMI as this uh, gentleman did, your in-hospital mortality is lower. Risk factors being defined here as anterior septal location, like uh, the patient that I just presented, diabetes, heart rate of uh, 100 beats per minute, systolic blood pressure, 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, and shown here is the independent effect of door-to-balloon times on in-hospital mortalities in subgroups stratified by A, symptom onset to door time. So very short symptom uh, to onset uh, to door times uh, means uh, uh, good outcomes and sort of consistent outcomes across the, the spectrum of, uh, of door to balloon. Uh, and as you get into uh, longer periods of uh, ischemia, door to balloon seems to matter a little bit more. And in all of the subgroups, uh, not to mince this too finely, suffice it to say that there's directional consistency across all these subgroups, anterior septal MI, diabetes, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, and uh, any risk factors. 
So in 2006, the, the, the focus of our life as interventional cardiologists on call came into existence. The Door to Balloon Alliance launches uh, with the assistance of the American College of Cardiology in 2006 with the goal of reducing door to balloon times to 90 minutes or less in hospitals that are treating STEMI with uh, emergency PCI. <clears throat> and D2B, uh, the D2B Alliance uh, builds on lessons from the ACC uh, Guidelines Applied in Practice or GAP program that shows that guideline adherence rates could be uh, dramatically improved by uh, um, systematically standardizing uh, the approach to uh, the process of care. So in 2006, D2B launches. Uh, by March 2008, two years, uh, less than two years later, uh, the achieved door to balloon time of less than 90 minutes is uh, is manifested in uh, in greater than 75 percent of patients. And from there, uh, January 2005 uh, to uh, September 2010, uh, you see a pretty dramatic drop in uh, door to balloon and 64 minutes or so is where the median door to balloon time has hovered uh, ever since. Uh, less than 90 minutes in 91 percent of patients by September 2020, less than 75 minutes in 70 percent of patients by September 2020. So really a dramatic shift in the way we treat MI. And uh, the anticipation, of course, is that patients are going to continue to do better and better. Uh, I'll say, you know, just as sort of an offhand comment, I can tell whenever there's someone new in our C-suite because somebody will come up with the idea that if uh, door to balloon of less than 90 minutes is good, less than 60 and less than 30 might be even even better. And there have been some hospitals around the country that have looked at uh, uh, basically idling an in-house team 24-7, 365. But when we really sort of focus on the data, now this is almost 100,000 admissions from 2005 to 2009. So I shared with you all of these laudable metrics uh, that we achieved as a, as a community of U.S. operators uh, with the uh, advent of the, the Door to Balloon Alliance. We look at 100,000 admissions for primary PCI for ST elevation myocardial infarction. What you find is that the median door to balloon time from 2005 to 2009 dropped from 83 uh, minutes down to 67 minutes. Uh, and mortality, interestingly, remains flat. What about anterior myocardial infarction? Uh, the previous slide suggested that if you have risk factors or if you've got antraceptal MI, there may be some differential outcomes. Here again, median door to balloon, and this is all in-hospital mortality, uh, remains relatively flat. Numerically higher than all comers, so about 5% uh, in-hospital mortality, 7% in-hospital mortality for anterior MI. And not surprisingly for cardiogenic shock, uh, mortality remains higher, but also flat. So uh, as median door to balloon time has fallen uh, in cardiogenic shock patients with a small numerical difference uh, in, uh, in the most contemporary data between uh, shock versus non-shock patients, mortality remains flat. Um, mortality, according to door to balloon times, as you can see here, uh, uh, from 2005, uh, uh, patients with door to balloon times less than 90 minutes, only about 60%, that rose to about 83%. Flat, just another way to look at the data, adjusted and unadjusted uh, risk uh, for in-hospital mortality from 2005 to 2009. And so, that is to say that you can certainly find papers. There was a very nice Lancet publication from a couple of years ago that suggested that this uh, lack of improvement in survival was because we're picking different types of patients. There's been secular trend in the way we practice infarct angioplasty, but we're also pick picking different patients, uh, ostensibly higher risk patients, and that's diluting some of the benefit that could have been ascribed to falling door to balloon times. I'm not sure I entirely believe that because there have been so many publications shown that we've sort of hit the ceiling in terms of what we can achieve in terms of survival with improving door to balloon time. So my you know, general response to uh, you know, queries from the C-suite, whether we can push our door to balloon times lower and lower and lower is that please show me the data that that's actually gonna result in meaningful improvements in clinical outcome. Um, focusing on anterior STEMI, uh, as I alluded to in the previous slide, there's something uniquely uh, dangerous about anterior STEMIs, likely uh, related to the uh, huge amount of myocardium that's differentially supplied by the LAD versus the circumflex of the RCA. Now, this is sort of uh, going to long-term mortality. What's interesting is that long-term morbidity and mortality in anterior STEMI patients treated with primary PCI has also remained somewhat stagnant. And this is the spread from where we sort of left off 2005 to 2009, all the way up to 2018, one-year mortality in blue, two-year mortality in green, 
and uh, purple representing two-year heart failure uh, admissions um, have uh, have not changed a whole lot. 20.7 becomes 20.5 uh, 13 years later. So this is kind of the sobering reality of what we do day in and day out. I think that uh, everybody anchors around the success stories uh, and the people uh, who get away with almost no um, uh, infarct or very low uh, biomarkers and so forth. In fact, you know, in fact, we've taken uh, anterior STEMIs and uh, they haven't even, uh, man, you know, they haven't even bumped a troponin. They got in so quickly, as improbable as that seems. But those are the exceptions. Regrettably, what you see on this slide is the rule. When we talk about the cardiogenic shock population as uh, a, a uniquely embattled population of STEMI patients, and this is from the cardiogenic shock working group, I'm very proud to say that we've been a, a member of the shock working group for a number of years, and a lot of the data shown on this uh, in this paper uh, comes from our institution, from the University of Chicago. Um, in this analysis, the majority of patients, about two thirds of these patients were STEMI and about one third were non-STEMI patients. Uh, the raw in-hospital mortality, 43%, significantly higher than what was seen in some of the uh, previous studies from NCDR of about 27%. Uh, and if you sort of stratify these patients based on baseline sky stage, you can see this association. Uh, stage BC patients do better, obviously, than stage D and E patients. And this is the final slide I'll show in this uh, section. This is really the 25-year the retrospective of what we have achieved in the contemporary era of primary PCI uh, in, uh, in, the, in the world of shock, specifically in the world of shock. And what's uh, remarkable is that, uh, you know, the, the historical era of pre-thrombolysis and thrombolysis in black and white, the contemporary era, uh, era of clinical trials in AMI shock starting with uh, Dr. Hockman's uh, shock trial in 1999 and all the way to ECLS shock just recently published by, uh, by Hol uh, Holger Thiele and colleagues. Uh, remarkable that we have just hovered around a 40 to 50% uh, mortality at uh, 30 days. So what does the evolving standard of care in STEMI look like? What should it look like? Well, first and foremost, we have epicardial vessel or infarct-related artery reperfusion and primary PCI with a focus on door-to-balloon uh, time uh, remains front and center. Uh, I'm not disparaging door-to-balloon times in any way, shape, or form. I think they're uh, enormously important uh, for an institution and for an entire country of practitioners. However, I mean to say that uh, we may have reached the ceiling of what we can accomplish with improving our workflow efficiency in primary PCI. Other things that we know work, aspirin early and indefinitely, oral P2Y12 inhibitors, um, uh, and uh, we'll sort of parse the data a little bit finer, uh, and maybe, maybe a signal of benefit for power aspiration thrombectomy, albeit uh, in one small uh, but well-constructed um, uh, trial. Uh, pretty much everything else is, uh, you know, sort of uh, enumerates things that we do in the cath lab, but not necessarily with a lot of ironclad data. Not to say that it's wrong. I mean, everyone has their personal and institutional experience and uh, and success stories around each one of these. But if you want to be objective about this, uh, these things that we do in the context of infarct angioplasty may or may not be associated with uh, strong RCT data. So objectively, what improves outcomes in STEMI? Well, potent P2Y12 inhibition versus clopidogrel. You've got Triton Timmy 38 and you've got uh, Plato suggesting that uh, prazogrel and ticagrel or respectively improve outcomes versus clopidogrel. And you've got uh, an ISAR study now suggesting that prazogrel uh, may be a little bit better uh, than uh, ticagrel or albeit with some study design uh, issues. Primary PCI versus fibrinolytics, door to balloon of less than 90, although as we get closer to 60, we don't see the commensurate improvement in mortality anyway. Early revascularization versus medical stabilization in uh, AMI shock with an even longer window of opportunity to intervene on these patients. Radial access versus femoral access is a bit of a contentious uh, issue. Uh, if you can get it done quickly, that's great. Uh, although if you're using micropuncture and, uh, and ultrasound for femoral access, that significantly closes the gap in uh, complications between radial versus femoral. Uh, complete revascularization versus culprit-only revascularization, and then GDMT and completion of cardiac rehab. It's estimated that only about 13 to 15% of eligible patients in this country actually complete cardiac rehabilitation. 
Um, there are no shortage of trials that have attempted to improve on infarct size and clinical outcomes in ST elevation MI. And uh, in this slide, I've sort of grouped them by device-based studies, uh, medications and antiplatelets, uh, agents to mitigate free radical injury and inflammation. And then currently, there's a study being planned called ISIDE AMI3, uh, which is looking at a sodium iodide analog for decreasing inflammation. In, uh, in primary PCI, in STEMI treated with primary PCI. Um, but restoring both the macrovascular and microvascular flow in STEMI is probably what's required to improve prognosis. This is one of the targets, the aspirational targets, we have not been able to hit all that well simply by putting a balloon and a stent uh, in the vessel. So think about this. In the 1970s uh, into the 80s, there was uh, uh, fibrinolytics from the 80s. Uh, onwards, there was uh, primary PCI in limited centers and then increasing numbers of centers. In the 90s, we saw the, uh, the dawn of bare metal stents. In 2003, uh, June was the uh, approval of the first drug-eluting stent. Uh, but outcomes have remained relatively the same because we're focusing on 10% of the, of the roadways, uh, only about 10% of the coronary tree is, is stentable. 90% of the myocardial blood flow is supplied by the capillary microcirculation and epicardial flow, unfortunately does not equal microvascular reperfusion. So microvascular uh, obstruction uh, post uh, STEMI uh, certainly does uh, impact clinical outcomes. This is data from seven primary PCI trials. Uh, looking at uh, microvascular obstruction by CMR using late gadolinium enhancement. Uh, and uh, MVO uh, is present in uh, nearly 60% of patients. Uh, and you can see as you stratify it by tertiles, all-cause mortality or heart failure hospitalizations uh, do tend to go up from the lowest tertile to the highest tertile. It's more than doubling of, uh, of all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalizations. And here's the scatter plot that actually, uh, that actually uh, relates or links infarct size with microvascular uh, uh, obstruction uh, from Dr. Dewaha's uh, paper. Um, and so the presence and extent of MVO measured by CMR after primary PCI and STEMI is strongly associated with mortality and hospitalization for heart failure within one year. Infarct size uh, uh, is strongly co uh, correlated with heart failure and death uh, as well. So if you, uh, depending on how you look at this, irrespective of how you look at this uh, here in four quartiles, 25% of patients treated with primary PCI had nearly 30% of their LV mass as residual infarct. And so, you know, this is a little bit of uh, bootstrapping, but if you think about human autopsy studies and animal studies on cardiogenic shock, you've got to knock out about 40% of the LV uh, mass in one fell swoop uh, in order to push uh, an animal or a patient into cardiogenic shock. Well, 30% uh, of the LV mass with residual infarct uh, is sort of towing that line. It's getting pretty close. It's not an insignificant amount of myocardial mass. Uh, uh, and this is primary PCI patients. Uh, patient level analysis across 10 randomized controlled trials published by Greg Stone uh, a number of years ago. And so both MVO and infarct size are independent predictors of one-year outcomes. Infarct size uh, plays out as uh, a 2% increase per 1% uh, uh, infarct size increase, and per 1% MVO, it's about an 8% increase in all-cause mortality. So let me talk a little bit now about the development of SSO2 therapy. This is a fantastic review paper by Dr. Cloner in uh, Jack Basic Translational Science uh, that I think is definitely worth a read. This very nicely summarizes the entire story arc of uh, SSO2. And while I think most people are just hearing about SSO2, uh, the field and the science uh, that uh, underlies uh, this therapy has been ongoing for a couple of decades, starting in the 1990s with, uh, with reperfusion injury. And I always um, sort of, you know, sort of remark that uh, uh, I spent, my father's a cardiologist. I spent uh, many weekends as a kid in his, um, in his animal lab, watching him do uh, animal experiments on reperfusion injury. And so it is interesting that, uh, that we're studying the same thing, uh, albeit separated by about, uh, about four decades. Um, and so, you know, the interest in uh, no reflow phenomenon, reperfusion injury uh, is uh, nearly uh, four decades old. Uh, and uh, the SSO2 concept was first introduced in uh, preclinical models in 1999. 
uh, I'll share with you some of the preclinical data. And then, of course, the clinical data more recently leading up to the FDA approval in 2019. Of course, something big happened in 2020 that kind of shut down the world. And uh, we sort of forgot about this uh, for a little while as we uh, just uh, focused on uh, treating critically ill patients with COVID. But uh, here we are a few years later uh, revisiting this. So the, the concept is, is uh, pretty simple. The idea here is to enhance tissue level perfusion with supersaturated O2 in the, uh, in the setting of microvascular plugging. And the observation from uh, many trials that I've shared with you is that despite successful PCI, capillaries can remain obstructed due to cellular debris, endothelial edema, uh, vasoconstriction, and so forth. And so highly concentrated O2 can diffuse into myocardium and endothelial tissue to relieve swelling independent of RBC traffic. And once that endothelial swelling has been mitigated or reduced in some fashion, then uh, normal microvascular flow can be uh, restored. So there are multiple mechanisms of action here. At least the three uh, important potential mechanisms are shown on this slide, O2 delivery through the diffusive effect of supersaturated plasma, independent of uh, RBC traffic, preserving vulnerable and viable myocytes in the patchy areas of malperfusion that have been demonstrated in every single animal study that's looked at this, reduce endothelial cell edema with restoration of normal microvascular flow, and then perhaps mitigation of free radical injury by downregulation of myeloperoxidase. We'll come back to this. Here are the scanning EM micrographs from uh, SSO2 control versus SSO2 treated pigs showing uh, the reduction in endothelial cell edema in uh, SSO2 uh, treated uh, animals with uh, uh, greater uh, vessel diameter and uh, greater and earlier restoration of normal flow to the uh, infarct zone and the ischemic penumbra around that. And indeed SSO2 doubles uh, blood flow to the ischemic left ventricle. Again, this is in a canine model. This is not uh, humans, and this is uh, the seminal work of Dr. James Spears and others uh, using microspheres, uh, showing that uh, after two hours of reperfusion, uh, microvascular blood flow in the SSO2 group was double that of the control group that got the same mechanical intervention opening up their, uh, the, uh, the occluded LAD. Um, here is the, the gross specimen uh, that sort of speaks for itself uh, in a swine AMI model, uh, an LAD infarct created with uh, one hour of balloon occlusion, uh, showing a significant reduction in infarct size. You can certainly see some patchy infarct in that, uh, in that uh, animal's uh, left ventricle. However, uh, a far bigger uh, uh, infarct in the, uh, in the control uh, specimen. Um, back to the free radical piece of this, I think that we all learned in medical school that uh, O2 is a good thing, too much O2 is a very bad thing, it uh, can potentially promote uh, reactive oxygen species and actually increase free radical injury uh, to uh, various tissues. Um, why, uh, you know, pouring uh, supersaturated O2 or basically aqueous O2 into a culprit vessel doesn't seem to do that, maybe linked to the reduction in myeloperoxidase levels. Uh, myeloperoxidase is an inflammatory enzymatic marker uh, that tracks free radical uh, activity and injury. That's actually down-regulated in, uh, in uh, SSO2. And so perhaps uh, it becomes uh, a wash at the very least. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any, uh, any free radical uh, activity that's deleterious, at least in animal models. So here's the clinical trial program. Uh, in broad strokes, AMIHOT1 was uh, uh, 269 randomized patients in US and Europe, all AMI 24 hours. Uh, AMIHOT2 was uh, 300 patients, 301 uh, anterior AMI and uh, six hours. And then ICHOT was the um, uh, confirmatory trial that led to uh, PMA approval. A little bit more detail on these trials. In total, 670 patients were randomized uh, in these three clinical trials. AMIHOT1 was really looking at um, uh, uh, was looking at uh, in inferior and anterior STEMI with less than 24 hours of, uh, of symptoms. And overall, the entire population was neutral. Uh, however, there was a strong signal of benefit in the anterior STEMI patients uh, and primary safety uh, endpoint uh, was met uh, all the way around in both anterior and inferior uh, STEMI patients. And so that really sort of sharpened the focus on anterior STEMI for AMIHOT2. 
which was published in 2009, showing that in uh, um, uh, anterior STEMI patients, uh, achieving uh, uh, TIMI 2 to 3 flow and uh, less than six hours of symptoms, uh, these, uh, these patients had a 26% relative infarct size uh, reduction, uh, again, with, uh, with safety. And then Icy Hot uh, more or less corroborated uh, what was seen previously uh, with, uh, with safety once again. Here's the trial design, uh, standard therapy versus SSO2, a one to three randomization. The uh, effectiveness was a reduction in uh, infarct size as measured by technetium uh, system uh, spec imaging, and then uh, a safety endpoint as well. Um, in uh, AMIHOT 1 and 2, looking at the anterior STEMI patients, a 26% relative risk reduction uh, in, uh, in infarct size. Uh, correlated with uh, both mortality and heart failure hospitalization reductions at one year. And what's interesting is that I think many times we reserve uh, these therapies for the patients that we believe clinically deserves it or really needs uh, every help that they can, uh, they can get. Um, and so in the overall population, you've got a 26% reduction in infarct size, but the patients who are, uh, the patient subgroups who are expected to quote unquote do well Patients who had short ischemic times, I shared with you before that there are differences between long and short ischemic times, and the patients who already had a pre-PCI TIMI of uh, two or three, meaning they didn't have a completely occluded vessel, there was already flow, albeit with ongoing ST elevations, these patients actually had marked benefit uh, compared to the overall population. And I'll just focus on the pre-PCI TIMI two to three patient. If you've got a vessel that's TIMI three, and you still got ST elevation, perhaps you've identified a patient who's having a microvascular STEMI, meaning something is wrong. If you can see flow into the branch vessels and it's TIMI-3, but you still have ST elevation in a patient with chest pain, clearly it's not the uh, epicardial vessel that's uh, primarily driving that ST elevation. LV remodeling also favorably influenced by SSO2 at, uh, at 30 days and uh, reduction in heart failure and uh, at death in one year, as compared with uh, uh, a pairwise match population from the infused AMI study. So this was in a direct comparison uh, in a single trial. This was icy hot patients versus uh, paired patients from infused AMI who did not uh, receive uh, SSO2. The safety data is uh, very uh, reassuring. I'll uh, come back to some uh, some uh, important considerations, however, uh, in the in the next section here, um, uh, that really uh, ensures that patients get through this without any fireworks. Um, and so, I would just summarize this section by saying that one in five uh, anterior STEMI patients will go on to de develop heart failure. Believe it; it's still true. Unfortunately, that uh, number hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, that heart failure may be very well managed, like the patient that I opened this presentation with, but they still have heart failure. This is a now 37, 38-year-old uh, gentleman who will have a lifetime of LV dysfunction. His EF does not go up above 40%. Um, SSO2 therapy has been shown to restore microvascular flow, reducing infarct size by about 26%, improving uh, LV geometry and volume. Uh, with a significantly uh, reduced uh, incidence of heart failure and mortality in SSO2-treated patients versus matched controls. So um, that's RCTs. Now just sort of transitioning to the practical uh, aspects of uh, implementing in this uh, in your lab. Uh, this is the real-world SSO2 data. This was uh, presented at ACC uh, 2023 from Corwell Health. Uh, again, uh, sort of historical controls uh, versus uh, patients after the launch of SSO2, uh, showing that um, uh, at one month and at uh, three months, uh, there are improvements in, uh, in heart function as measured by ejection fraction that's uh, more or less consistent with the RCT data. This is data from the Miami Cardiac and uh, Vascular Institute presented at Sky 2023, uh, again, showing uh, improvements that sort of track what we would expect to. Um, and I think this is enormously important. It's very small numbers of data. And uh, probably at this point, there's been about a thousand commercial cases uh, or less performed in the United States. Uh, we've done about a dozen cases at University of Chicago. Um, and so we're learning uh, on the fly, but I think it is reassuring that uh, the real world, which is ostensibly messier than the rarefied world of clinical trials, the real world does seem to be tracking uh, what were you know what was seen in the uh, the RCT data, 
this is some more data from uh, uh, Professor Andreas Schaefer uh, from uh, from Germany looking at microvascular obstruction. Again, this is a single center experience uh, using uh, CMR uh, at uh, at his uh, institution in Hanover. Um, and so, you know, here are some reasons why uh, SSO2 may offer a pretty significant incremental therapeutic uh, value over the things that we're already doing. STEMIs like cardiogenic shock aren't going away anytime soon. Anterior STEMIs are uniquely dangerous. Uh, and we're sort of reaching individual therapeutic ceilings in terms of um, what we're able to accomplish. Uh, with uh, with our therapies in the cath lab. SSO2 is cheap, simple, and effective, and I'll share that with you in the last few minutes here. Uh, and it's uh, a therapeutic niche, uh, which uh, largely uh, is under-recognized and totally unaddressed until uh, its um, approval in the United States. So initiating an SSO2 program, uh, the actual console, uh, nuts and bolts of it is really simple. So here's the mobile console with the disposable cartridge that mixes uh, patient's arterial blood with aqueous O2 and then the five French delivery catheter to return blood into the left main. And again, this is for anterior STEMI, LAD culprit within six hours of uh, symptom onset, although we're somewhat liberal with that because uh, frequently patients will have stuttering chest pain uh, before it becomes persistent. Uh, if they're having ongoing chest pain, they have ongoing ST elevation, they've not queued out, then uh, they're eligible in my opinion. Uh, that's what we've been doing at our institution, but really focusing on anterior STEMIs, although there is a body of data building with large inferior STEMIs with RCA culprits. Um, the capital and disposables are shown here. This is the downstream console, which is uh, a, a self-contained uh, device with AC power and battery backup uh, that's responsible for uh, creating the, uh, the supersaturated blood that's returned. Uh, all of the uh, catheters and accessories are shown here with the, with the SKU numbers. Uh, very importantly, there is a purpose-built seven French large uh, high-flow sheath that's uh, necessary for this. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, this is where the magic happens uh, in the, the clinical uh, console. Um, this is the actual SSO2 hyperoxemic reperfusion therapy uh, uh, technology. I won't uh, bore you with, uh, with details of it other than to say that uh, this piston on the, the first chamber draws in uh, about three liters, excuse me, three milliliters uh, per minute of, uh, of saline. Uh, it mists it into the central chamber uh, where it's combined with a very high uh, concentration of uh, oxygen. The supersaturated uh, saline, uh, aqueous saline, basically mists on the side of that canister, runs down the walls of that canister into a capillary tube that's too small to allow for bubble enucleation. 3.2 liters of, uh, excuse me, 3.2 milliliters per minute of uh, aqueous O2 is mixed with 97 milliliters per minute of arterial blood that's uh, taken out of the femoral artery. It's mixed and then returned uh, at a flow rate of 100 milliliters per minute uh, through the five French catheter, which uh, sits in the, uh, in the left main. This is the high flow sheet that I alluded to. Uh, if uh, this is on back order or uh, we don't have it or we can't find it, you can use an eight French sheet. Um, and I would say this is the only sort of uh, pain point uh, with uh, SSO2 from a procedural standpoint. You do have to use uh, femoral access, uh, at least for the draw, and then uh, you can return it via radial artery if uh, you started with the radial, uh, or if you started with uh, ultrasound guided femoral, then you just upsize to the seven French sheet at the end and run the five French catheter uh, through there. Preferred approach is a, a single stick femoral approach using the seven French uh, uh, introducer, which is made by Merit. Uh, alternative is a minimum five French sheath uh, and a return via the radial artery, uh, the, the five French uh, BSC catheter. Um, unfortunately, the suction rates on the radial artery, uh, suction rates through the sheath would collapse a radial artery. There have been some investigators that have experimented with uh, putting an R2P sheath into the descending aorta and using that as the draw although that has not been validated. And so the vascular access configurations are shown here. For all of our cases, we have uh, done uh, ultrasound-guided uh, femoral access, knowing it's an anterior STEMI that would qualify for, uh, for SSO2. These are all clinical cases. They're not in the context of any uh, trial or registry at the moment. Uh, and um, uh, we have not uh, done um, uh, dual cannulation with radial femoral. The uh, 
the stopcock is a very important component of it here, this green stopcock, uh, because you do have to draw uh, uh, ACTs every uh, 15 to 20 minutes to ensure that your ACT remains above 250. This is safety point number one uh, to ensure that you don't have any clotting. Uh, there were some isolated cases in the early experience when ACTs fell of stents clotting. Uh, uh, during uh, therapy that has not been seen in any of the registry data or the subsequent uh, single center experiences has not been seen at our center. But we do, we are mindful to keep that ACT well above 300 uh, seconds so that uh, we have a little bit of buffer in case it drops rapidly. Um, that's uh, safety point number one. And then uh, practical issue number two is, uh, is uh, tapping fluoro every 10 minutes or so to make sure that the catheter hasn't migrated and that you are in fact infusing down the, uh, down the LAD. Um, and so uh, you've got about 60 seconds. If you forget to do this, you've got about 60 seconds to unhook everything, draw your ACT and rehook everything without bubbles, uh, which becomes a little bit of a challenge. Uh, before the machine will uh, completely time out. Um, there's this QR code on the side of the machine uh, with setup instructions. If you just follow the uh, instructions without skipping steps or uh, you know, doubling up on uh, what you're doing, uh, it goes very, very smoothly. The, the video is about three minutes long. And so uh, we've got uh, uh, some nurses who are less familiar. They just pull that up while we're doing the case. Um, and start prepping for SSO2. If we're going to do the case uh, with SSO2, we start prepping around the time that we have crossed the LAD lesion. When the balloon is inflated and uh, stopping the clock uh, is generally when we start uh, uh, plugging in the cartridge. And uh, we wait to prime, of course, until we're done with the case because you don't want blood sitting in the, in the uh, chambers uh, for very long before you, uh, before you start infusing. And so the timeline of an ideal LED uh, primary PCI uh, plus SSO2 kind of looks like this. I mean, when it goes quickly, it goes, you know, very quickly. Uh, you can see in this particular case, I had my fellow just sort of scribble uh, timestamps on our uh, drape there just to kind of get a sense of how quickly these things go. About 31 minutes from the start of the case to final angio images. Um, this was our uh, first case. It was perhaps not the best case to start with because it was a uh, a patient with multiple comorbidities, which unfortunately is uh, typical in uh, our institution. We have a very high level of medical complexity and surgical complexity. Um, so clean STEMIs are few and far between, but uh, nevertheless, we did do uh, SSO2. We also uh, did uh, um, power aspiration thrombectomy because we just couldn't declot this vessel. Didn't feel good about stenting it without uh, reducing the clot burden. Um, and as I said, in the final panel, it's really important to just take fluoro uh, images every 10 minutes or so to make sure that uh, make sure that um, the catheter hasn't migrated. There's a countdown clock on the console. As you get to 60 minutes, it tells you to, uh, to uh, unhook everything. Um, there is uh, some blood left in the circuit, which unfortunately you can't give back, but it's not a whole lot of blood. Um, you just press end procedure, disconnect everything, take your final images and then close as you normally would, manual or uh, uh, with a vascular closure device. And so finally, um, you know, SSO2, I think, uh, fits in with other uh, nascent technologies that are emerging. Uh, the difference here is that SSO2 is actually FDA approved and uh, has been clinically used in the United States in many hundreds of cases at this point. Uh, ventricular unloading is the other big uh, sort of uh, hope that we're uh, pinning a lot of uh, uh, um, you know, myocardial salvage on, uh, if, uh, uh, door to unload actually, uh, works, that would be an amazing thing, but, uh, that's sort of a, a speculative statement at this point. There was a lot of optimism around, uh, percutaneous, uh, intermittent coronary sinus occlusion or PIXO, uh, which was a technology that redistributes blood flow, uh, and kind of forces it into the ischemic, uh, territory or the ischemic penumbra of an, of a culprit vessel. Uh, unfortunately, the most recent, uh, clinical trial, failed to meet its primary endpoint. And so the, the future of PIXO remains, uh, remains unclear at best at this point. And there's a number of other technologies that are far uh, behind. So at this point, from the standpoint of uh, mitigating microvascular uh, injury in uh, infarct angioplasty, uh, we essentially have uh, SSO2. So with that, I will stop there. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. Latif, for the kind invitation to speak. And I'm uh, happy to take questions. Sandeep, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, microvascular obstruction is kind of, for me, 
really one of the uh, true unmetallical needs we still face in coronary interventions, particularly in STEMI. And I am just like so glad that in the last few years, it's been gaining a lot more attention. Uh, and we're no longer talking about epicardial perfusion, reperfusion when we think about STEMIs, but we're talking about myocardial reperfusion. I think our whole way of thinking now has to change, like you've mentioned. You know, we, we've done as much as we can with door to balloon time. So this area is close to my heart. I, I worked with Pixel for a number of years when I was in Europe, and I'm working with another startup called CoreFlow, also to try and figure out how can we treat, diag well, diagnose and treat microvascular obstruction um, in the cath lab? Um, I have a lot of questions, but I also have a lot of my team members who are on fellows as well as attending. So let me pass it on to them first. And then maybe if there's something they haven't asked, I might ask you a couple of questions in the end. Um, so Saul, uh, go ahead. I see you have your, uh, your hand up. Thank you, Dr. Latif, and thank you, Dr. Nathan, for the amazing lecture. Um, when you were describing the mechanism of action of this device, one patient in particular came, came to mind. We had a case yesterday of an RCA and STEMI. When we went down with the imaging catheter, we unfortunately got a non-reflow phenomenon, and despite of our best efforts at the end of the case, we couldn't really reestablish a good flow for this patient in particular. So I know most of the studies have been in STEMI patients. Do you have any data for end STEMIs or for other situations where you get no reflow, which is unfortunately a condition where we don't have an F, F, a good treatment for, the, for these patients? Could this be something where we could be using this device in the future? Yeah, you know what, that's that's an excellent question. And um, there are many potential targets for this therapy. Now, any answer that I'm going to give you to this, uh, you know, to your uh, excellent question is, is purely speculative. So this is a CME program, I just want to, you know, say that, you know, what we're talking about is clinical care, not uh, randomized clinical trials. Um, that said, if you look at grace and many other uh, data sets, um, the uh, grace being the global registry of acute coronary events, the one-year mortality for non-STEMI is actually worse numerically than the one-year mortality for STEMI treated with primary PCI. And so non-STEMI is not a benign diagnosis. And there is, a, I think, a significant measure of classification bias, right? There's misclassification of non-STEMIs. You know, you think about classically of uh, the circumflex STEMI, which is uh, electrocardiographically silent. Is that any less deadly because it didn't uh, tip the automated reading of uh, STEMI on uh, on your ECG? Of course not. Um, I uh, have actually treated one uh, LAD uh, uh, non quote unquote non STEMI. How it's a non STEMI, I have no idea. The proximal LAD was completely occluded with very uh, sort of marginal, uh, you know, collateral flow. Maybe that's the reason why there was an ST elevations um, with SSO two. I think other potential targets are no reflow associated with uh, atherectomy, uh, with degenerated vein grafts, uh, with non-STEMI, as you say. I mean, the, the STEMI, non-STEMI uh, designation is, is based on ECG. And the last thing I'll say about this is that the ECG reader on Saturdays or Sundays will have a stack of 150 ECGs to, to, to plow through. And there'll be somebody with, uh, you know, flip T waves and, uh, you know, uh, subtle ST depression. And then there's one ECG in that stack about one patient where the STs are elevated. So now you start to, you know, get curious and you say, where is this person? Well, they're sitting, you know, they're sitting on the floor somewhere with, uh, with a diagnosis of non-STEMI having transient ST segment elevation. So I think no reflow and patients that come in uh, with an occluded vessel, albeit uh, with a non-STEMI diagnosis, there's no reason to suspect that it wouldn't work, but you know, as we saw with Amy Hot One, there is sort of a differential benefit in anterior STEMI versus inferior STEMI. So, you know, I'll sort of finish where I started. I think that any answer is going to be speculative, but there's a lot of different, and you know, there's also um, potential targets in acute limb ischemia, in cerebral perfusion, in uh, in stroke, and you know, really, you know, the question is, are there enough research dollars and bandwidth, uh, investigative bandwidth to, uh, to to look at all of these therapies or all of these therapeutic niches? That's funny. Thank you. Uh, Scott? Uh, excuse me, I have a bit of a cold, so uh, Go ahead. I apologize for the deep voice I am presenting. But, uh, you know, I this has really been one of the true holy grails of reperfusion, which is to get to the microvascular, improve the no reflow cases which clearly have a very poor outcome. 
I've had great faith in adenosine and the multi milligram uh, dose range based by uh, on some Italian work. The um, often it's very important to get it down the vessel. Have you ever tried using a larger perfusion cat type catheter, such as a, a, a you know a, a not mechanical but an, a hand aspiration catheter? to deliver this directly down the coronary, not just at the ostium of the left main, but into the area of no flow. Yeah, so uh, we, we haven't tried that with SSO2, with pulse spray uh, vasodilators, be it adenosine, nicardipine, uh, sodium nitroprusside, we almost uh, you know routinely uh, give that through, um, uh, through uh, microcatheters. I think the concern is that for the duration of uh, that this has to be dwelled, having a uh, microcatheter or um, some other apparatus, uh, you know, export, something like that, um, past the area of stent uh, is, is of concern because there were some early stent thrombosis uh, events that required the vessel to be reopened, mostly associated with uh, falling ACTs. But I think that that's the concern because you do have to, you know, the duration, I kind of glossed over this, the second pain point of this therapy, uh, again, cards on the table, um, is that you do have to uh, to infuse for 60 minutes. Um, in the registries that are ongoing, we will probably have some permutations and combinations of therapy that were not allowable in the clinical trials, meaning, you know, what happens if a patient gets kind of squirmy at the 37-minute mark and, you know, you only uh, infuse for a grand total of uh, 40, 40 minutes instead of 60. What do, what do you get then? We should have some of that data from uh, from rescue, hopefully, and uh, some of the registries that are planned. But to answer your question directly, uh, we haven't put anything down the vessel um, and dwelled it. Um, Scott, do you have another question? Can I move on to Mark? Oh, we can go to Mark. Okay, Mark. Uh, hi, Sandeep. Thank you for, for an excellent talk. Uh, just an observation and two questions. Uh, the observation being, with the recently published MIN trial, it's interesting that, you know, in the in the liberal transfusion arm, um, it wasn't statistically significant, but there was a trend towards reduction in car cardiovascular endpoints with a liberal um, uh, strategy for blood transfusion in, in all types of MI, you know, one, two, and four, and it was strongest in one. So that, that kind of dovetails a little bit with what you're saying. My one question is, with the IC hot or IC hot and, and AMI hot studies, do we know the average hemoglobin going into the trial in those patients? That's a great question. I don't know that off the top of my head. I want to say that it was uh, north of ten. Okay. Um, in in general, they were not anemic. I want to say if I was going to put money on it, I would say probably closer to eleven. Got it. And the second question is: Has anybody looked at? Uh, blood smears from these patients as this is happening or after it's happened to see if the red cell integrity is still there or if there's a lot of plasma free hemoglobin available, you know, that becomes evident after after hyperox therapy. You know, uh, I think if anyone's looked at it, it's probably Dr. Spears in uh, animal models, but I don't think it's been looked at in humans. And it's it's such an interesting question. Um, you know, it, it, it's when we started with this about a year and a half ago at our institution, um, it, it was really, you know, th there was such little world experience with this. Now, you know, more recently, there's been, you know, cases being done uh, every single day around the world. But you think about this in the spectrum of other things that we do. I mean, you know, on any given day, you know, there's probably dozens and dozens of rotoblader cases being done uh, mm -hmm. across the United States. Right. Um, and so we're just growing our body of uh, knowledge. And we're asking, we're sort of coming up with more questions than uh, we have the bandwidth to answer at this point. Some of it will be answered uh, by the registry data, including the, you know, especially the international registry that's being planned. But those kinds of really specific questions, I think, uh, you know, deserve some attention, has not been looked at yet. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Andrea? Uh, yes, I, uh, yes uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the great, this great, uh, great talk. 
uh, of uh, one question is in regards uh, to uh, patient selection. So I was fascinated by the the, uh, the evidence that uh, this uh, this device actually uh, works uh, better, has the better outcome in patients that are early comers, uh, uh, which to me was kind of counterintuitive. I would have expected late comers uh, to be the one benefiting most. So in how can we identify these patients? Are there going to be indexes of microvascular obstruction? I mean, I know there are studies that are going. Uh, where do you see us uh, going into trying to, uh, to find uh, the best patients that could really um, benefit from this, uh, uh, this technique and this uh, technology that at this moment is, uh, is fairly, if, if you allow me, uh, unpractical for all comers? So, um, and, uh, and the second question is, how can we make this a bit more practical and uh, uh, easy to to adopt in in a cat lab that uh, um, that obviously has needs to be very fast and efficient yeah so I think the issue of practicality is an important one and and I think you know reading between the lines the practical aspect of it is the time that's involved in you know infusing after the completion of a completion of a STEMI. Um, you know, the, the registry data may inform us uh, as to, you know, the, the sort of a comparable amount of uh, clinical benefit with uh, shortened infusion times. Right now, it's, uh, it's 60 minutes. And uh, the all-comers piece of this is at the conclusion of the PCI, if you still have too many zero flow, then this probably isn't going to work. You need to get some blood down the vessel. Uh, and, uh, you know, the letter of the FDA law, so to speak, is within six hours of presentation or six hours of, uh, excuse me, uh, symptom onset. Uh, some folks fall out of that window. Uh, there are institutions that are a little bit more liberal with that than, uh, than others. There are some institutions that have adopted this that have said, basically, it's just going to be, uh, you know, the people who are exactly at, uh, at six hours and not, not a minute more than that. Um, in the spirit of practicality, I think that, uh, you know, some institutions have said that this is going to be a daytime therapy. We just can't, uh, we don't have the bandwidth uh, with a single team to idle uh, that team for one hour. You know, I I'm, I'm sort of circumspect about this because uh, we know what's kind of good for the institution and good for workflow and, and, and so forth. But if it's your mom, or your dad, you want the kitchen sink thrown at them. You want absolutely everything done, whether it's two in the morning or two in the afternoon. So that's one point. The, the second point is that, you know, it, it's not a, you know, if you do this right, if your VAT people code this, you know, bring this in at uh, an appropriate cost and uh, your coding people know what they're doing, this is a cost neutral to profitable, slightly profitable therapy, number one. And as physicians, we get 12 RVUs for doing it. 12 RVUs is, uh, you know, about what you get for a rotoblader case. For any atherectomy, it's about 11.7 RVUs. Um, so, you know, there is some remuneration for it. We're not, uh, this isn't just pro bono work that we're doing. And at the end of the day, I mean, you know, it is a it's hard to look away from the clinical benefit that's been demonstrated in the, in the trials. So we have not at our institution, admittedly with a lower volume of uh, STEMI than many high volume institutions, although there are no high volume uh, STEMI places within the city of Chicago because there are so many cath labs. There's 84 cath labs in the state of Illinois serving 12.7 million people. Um, in our institution, doing an annual STEMI volume of about uh, 100 cases or so, about 75 or 80 are reportable cases for, uh, for, uh, for metrics. Um, you know, we have not put any limitations on it. Um, it would be nice to be able to move these patients off the table. Um, in the lab that I worked in previously, we had a semen swing lab, uh, which, you know, sort of, I started scratching my head a little bit, would that be an application? So you had a single uh, angiostar uh, C-arm that would uh, swing between two labs and you had lead air walls that would come in. So you could prep patients simultaneously in two rooms. When you're done with one case, you could swing the camera over there. So long as you have a team monitoring it, you could potentially do a case in the other room and then just swing the camera over. You know, I mean, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? The catheter is going to get dislodged for a portion of the therapy and you're going to have to push it back in. So I don't know. We may need to start thinking about creative solutions like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I see there's a question from one of our fellows uh, who wanted to ask about clinical studies in this. What has been used 
to measure restoration of microvascular blood flow during the index admission. And I, I want to ask the same thing. I mean, what's been used to, to look at infarct size? And she's asking about IMR, PET, I guess CMR is the other question. Yeah, there is some CMR data that's accruing in some investigator-initiated uh, studies that um, you know will likely move forward. There isn't a large body of data with uh, with IMR. Um, historically, it's been uh, uh, cardiac magnetic uh, resonance, and uh, in the studies, uh, TC99, so technetium spect, um, mm -hmm. is what was used to quantify um, uh, infarct size. Okay, great. Um... I want to see if there's any other any other questions from the team. Uh, if maybe you put your hand up. Um, I don't see any. Um, Sandeep, thank you. It's, you've given us a lot to think about. And, you know, I, like I said to you in the beginning, I'm a huge believer in microvascular obstruction. Um, I've been looking at this therapy for a while for our lab, and you know we're going to have a long discussion as a team about it. I guess our biggest reluctance has always been workflow, uh, yeah. and you know uh, we have we have one of the busiest STEMI programs in New York State, uh, being in the Bronx, uh, and we see a lot of patients, and so you know sometimes there are two or three STEMIs in a night, uh, so you know, staying an extra 60 minutes on the table, at least 60 minutes, is probably a little bit longer when you think about everything else, the setup and so on, uh, does um, concern us a little bit. Um, but it's something we need to think about. Um, Mark was just asking um, also, I mean, you said there is reimbursement. Do you have any idea what the cost is, um, like to start a, 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 a program? Yeah, so, you know, it's the cost of disposables. Uh, Zoll has been great with working with us and other institutions to basically keep the console there uh, with a, a bulk purchase of several cartridges. I think it was five cartridges. The cartridges and disposables are about $7,000. Okay. So it's it's not very expensive and it is cost neutral to slightly profitable. We've actually looked at, uh, you know, the, uh, the first uh, several cases that we did to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, wasting money on this. As I said, the physician reimbursement uh, is uh, 12 work RVUs. Um, so, you know, you're compensated for the extra hour. And what we've been doing just to sort of minimize time on the back end, essentially, we have the nurses call report at the 30 minute infusion mark. So they call report to the CCU. That's when we find out that the CCU bed is empty, but it's not clean yet. You know, it allows for all of those things to happen so that at the conclusion, one picture, make sure the vessel's open, no issues, close, and then, uh, you know, transition off the bed. The bed is already in the room. So along the way, we have picked up these small little workflow efficiencies. None of them are earth shattering, but in total, it really uh, minimizes the uh, the extra time. It really is. You know, if you plan this out correctly and you start prepping the, the cartridge and so forth, uh, as soon as your wire crosses the lesion, it really is 60 minutes. Sure. Excellent. Um... Wow, this has been fantastic. I've learned so much um, just when you think you know it all because uh, I didn't know a lot about supersaturated <clears throat> oxygen, so I've learned quite a lot today. Uh, I wanted to thank you for giving us as a team something to think about and the educational value of your talk, which I, I think, you know, even for our general cardiology fellows who joined, um, we just had a discussion yesterday in, you know, morning report about microvascular occlusion. So this was really perfect to showing some of the data around it and the impact of microvascular occlusion. Um, I also wanted to thank, thank the Zal team for arranging this and helping us, you know, just really speak to a colleague and a friend like you to really share your experience of how you've done this in your institution. And I guess you've given us a lot to think about. So we really appreciate that. David and um, uh, Mike, thank you for setting this up. Uh, we really appreciate the effort. Azim, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, it's an honor to present at your uh, your CAP conference. Yeah, we really Thanks, everyone.